What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Altitude Show. I'm your host, Dave Brinker. The Altitude Show is brought to you by Mountain Tough. Mountain Tough is a program that I started out in Bozeman, Montana with a small group of gentlemen. One of them is named Dustin. He's like Hercules, and the guy knows more about fitness and health than anybody I've ever met. He founded the company, and he created this program that is good for beginners and elite athletes alike. It's a functional fitness program for enjoying the outdoors, basically. It was, it was structured around hunting, but really anybody that likes being in the mountains can use it. It's on the app store. It's MTN Tough. Get the app. I use their minimal gear daily workouts, which are like 35 to 45 minutes a day. They're always different. You can do it right at your house. You don't need a lot of equipment. You should check it out. It'll change your body and mind. Use my code DAVE20 for 20% off, and you will not regret it. The Outdoor Show is also brought to you by Go Hunt. Dot com. Go Hunt is the hunting company. Everything that you need for hunting is on GoHunt.com. But the biggest thing, especially this time of year, is researching what you're going to do this year, whether that be draw odds or unit information, species information, trophy potential, things like that. And to get into that, to access that on Go Hunt, you need to be a, a member of their insider program, which I have a code for that too. It's altitude. You'll get 20% off to join and become an insider. Once you do that, you can also use that same code on their gear shop and buy all kinds of stuff, including this wonderful and amazing hat I'm wearing right now, which is my new favorite half. They call it their Softy 2.0. It's pretty sick. Um, but you can also buy like actual hunting gear. All the best brands are there. Go check it out. GoHunt.com. All right. Today I have Blake Brinker, which is, just happens to be my brother on the podcast. We've been trying to do this for a while. What's up, dude? What up, man? Yeah, just watching the snowfall. Yeah, yeah. Blake, I wanted to kick it off with what is Piece of Shit Friday? And why <laughs> why, why does today feel like Piece of Shit Friday? Well, it is Piece of Shit Friday. It Describe is Friday. It. What is it? What is, what is Piece of Shit Friday? Yeah, so, you know, it this starts... Is something that, this is something that you coined, right? Yeah. Yeah, it All is right. myself and my business partner, Brad Thomas of, of 14 years. You know, it's essentially a lot of you out there who are, you know, small business owners, entrepreneurs, founders, creators relate to this where, um, you know, every week you start off and you're like, man, we're going to like this week is going to change everything. We're going to we're going to make moves. You know, people are going to take us more seriously than they ever have. We're going to make more money than we ever have. Something big is going to go down. And then, you know, over the course of the week, you kind of get your ass kicked and uh, you arrive at Friday and your enthusiasm is at an all time low and you've never felt like a bigger piece of shit. That is why we call Friday a piece of shit Friday. It's so true. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> what What is it about it? I was uh, equating entrepreneurship last night on my drive home from jujitsu after getting strangled for an hour. Mm. Uh, it's so like, there's so many parallels in, into that. Like just like actually just doing something for fun where you actually get your ass kicked for a period of time. And I was totally. driving home cause this week's been a little bit like that. Like this morning I'm like, Ugh, I'm just ready for the weekend. It's kind of felt like one of those weeks where you just can't get ahead no matter how hard you try. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I was thinking about your piece of shit Friday thing last night, driving home. I'm like, this is like the epitome of that. Like I end my week with just getting strangled from behind for an hour. And then the, mo <laughs> the moment that I'm actually winning a match, I accidentally headbutt a kid and like split open his eye oh, Jesus. and he's bleeding on the mat. I'm like, okay, <laughs> this week's over. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, look, um, we talk. Brad and I and, and other peers of mine and, you know, you and I talk about this all the time that being an entrepreneur, um, you really have two choices at the end of the day, at the end of piece of shit Friday, you laugh or you cry and it's too hard not to laugh. That's for sure. And it's also for sure that sometimes you need to cry. So I think the answer is that you both laugh and you cry. Um, but, you know, having a good sense of humor about, the, the level of adversity that you face when you're trying to bring new ideas to life or to do your own thing. I mean, it's just, it's real. And uh, anyone who's been at it long enough will tell you that. So, yeah. What, uh, that was born in your tech, tech days? 
Oh, I think the pain of it was born in my tech days, but it only became like apparent, um, you know, just like any other kind of wisdom, it takes a while to take shape. Um, but yeah, definitely born in, in the world of, of startup life. Um, but I, I see it, I see it across the board. I mean, it doesn't matter like whether you have a tech startup or you're, you know, you started a, uh, you know, mom and pop spot down the street, like the the level of adversity is 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 pretty consistent no matter what it is that you're doing so again laugh or cry and uh i think that humor is uh is amazing medicine especially in the face of that kind of weekly cycle of getting your ass kicked and having ego death you know at least once a month <laughs> or like 20 times a day what i think is yeah. funny is, is yeah, like as i meet more and more successful what would be coined as successful quote unquote um business owners Mm -hmm. Um, my latest example was Josh Smith with Montana knife company. And he actually just did a post about this cause he was joking about it on the podcast about how everybody thinks they're so big, you know, they, they have made it right. He's yeah. like, dude, I just three years ago, I was a lineman. And literally this morning I woke up, got a cup of coffee, walked out my back door through my yard into my office door. That's in my shop still. <laughs> and sure. I'm cutting, cutting knives in my shop. So like everybody thinks it's like, but the more people I meet that are like, again, successful, I don't think that adversity actually ever stops. It actually gets to be more. And he was talking about that too, how like they have 52 employees, they're killing it, all these things. But now like they got to make some really big bets. Like now the bets are actually getting really risky, like sure. buying huge, really expensive machinery, buying buildings, building more things. Whereas like, he's like, dude, like at first I was making like a hundred knives. Like if you lose, right. eh, family's all right. But like now we're like leveraging things to, to buy buildings. And now it's like real. And the bigger you get, it just keeps going. It seems like, so that adversity you're talking about, I actually don't believe that ever goes away. I think it gets worse. Maybe just the way you deal with it changes. For sure. You know, I've done quite a bit of work with um, expeditions um, over the last decade. And this reminds me of, let's say, the journey that someone takes to climb Mount Everest. You can, you can take a helicopter to base camp. But the way that most people climb Everest is that they start in the Kumbu Valley and they trek, uh, I think, you know, 60, 70 odd miles to acclimatize their body to that elevation that you're going to, which base camp is at 21,000 feet. Um, and then you're at base camp and okay, well, we're, we're at Mount Everest. Um, the, the stakes of you trekking through the Kumbu Valley are pretty low. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could break your leg or something like that, but you know, the, um, the mortality rate for, for trekking the Kumbu Valley is not high. Well, but there's still risk associated with it, but then you get to base camp and you have to go from base camp through the Kumbu ice fall, which a lot of people have died, died in. And it's extremely perilous um, and, and just horrifically scary. Um, and you get through it and it's like, well, now you actually have to climb the mountain and, you know, so on and so forth. The higher that you go on the mountain, the higher the stakes. And then you get to a certain point above 26,000 feet that's called the death zone. And the reason why they call it the death zone is because your body is actually dying. You cannot live for more than now. There's a couple of exceptions where Sherpas have lived for, you know, up to, I think, two days above the death zone in extreme circumstances and uh, live to tell about it. But in fact, above 26,000 feet, your body is actually dying and you have another um, another 3000 feet to go. And of course, the old mountaineer uh, wisdom is uh, you get to the top, right? So now you're at the top of Mount Everest, the highest point in the world. Well, guess what? 90% of the accidents happen on the way down. So now you got to make your way down and not die. And I think it's a great analogy to what you're talking about. Like <laughs> it's this whole, every single part of the journey has its own level of risk, its own level of stakes. And certainly you could draw a parallel to starting a company. Um, you know, Josh, what Josh is really talking about is that, you know, they're, they're going through the Kumbu ice fall, you know? Um, and that shit's real. Yeah. Why, what do you think the allure of it is? Why, think, if it's, if it's so crazy 
and it never it only gets harder and the stakes only get more what's the point yeah i mean again people ask mountaineers all the time like why are you doing this um I don't think that people ask entrepreneurs that that question as much, but perhaps they should. Um, I think that's because they they assume they're doing it for the money. I think people assume like th there's this sure. weird thing that exists in everybody's head. It, it, the, the moment you coin yourself a founder, they think you're rich. <laughs> like if I just say I'm the founder of X, I can start an yeah, LLC well, it's today. A status thing for sure. It's a yeah. Status thing. Yeah. They're like, oh, you must be really wealthy. So the, the, I think the the superficial allure seems to be money status like it's the sexy stuff but what's it because once you get well, into it you, you realize that that's the that's that ain't coming quick or maybe ever at all so then right. you're like what actually is the point right so so what i would say to that is um, okay Jor jordan peterson <laughs> depends on what you mean by entrepreneur um no so look it's uh the noble part of it is most people want creative and financial freedom, right? Like this is at the core of our being is this desire to be able to do what we want and, you know, make what we want. And I think underneath that layer, there's this desire that most if not all people have, which is to like matter. And if, if we would, we would actually, if we can't individually matter, if we've given up on that, or if we just don't have the self-belief to, to strive for that, then we want to be a part of something that matters. Mm -hmm. And I think that the older that you get, the more that you kind of like, you know, scoop the shovel as, as the man wants you to, and, you know, clock in, clock out that the more that that internal desire to have that creative and financial freedom and to be a part of something that matters becomes more, um, awake in us. And so I think that everyone experiences some dimension of it, but for those of us who are called, you know, actively to kind of like cut against the grain and do our own thing. I think at the core of it is the same reason why mountaineers climb mountains. It's like to uncover like a deeper layer of themselves that, that, that matters to, to do something that matters to, to be a part of shaping the narrative instead of just being a, a, a statistic. I mean, honestly, like, and of course in the world of business, there's also the benefit of, I guess, course the financial side right that you think of that but i but honestly i mean that that <laughs> that gets into a whole thing we could talk about but like the reality is, is that most of the people that you look at as being successful are not rich and well they're not rich in money they may be rich in wisdom they may be rich in character because they've gone through such a a strange and unyielding metamorphosis of peeling back all the layers of bullshit to where they're actually fighting for something that does matter. But like, yeah, man, I mean, I think that's, that's the best that I can say is, is that pursuit. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, I think you're right. I think sometimes, I think a lot of times it does start out with this like fantasy that you're going to be like, you, you sign those papers to start this company. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, you're going to be flying private jets and like smoking cigars. I yeah. do think that people have the fantasy of that, especially younger people. Um, but at the end of the day, if you peel the onion back, I do think it's like, cause a lot of people, especially Americans, a lot of your identity comes back to what you do for a living. And so yeah. it, it comes back to like, I was the guy that started this as a really special thing like if you do start something that is successful like that's a that's something to be proud of for sure especially if had a, if the thing you started has a positive impact yeah um which is more valuable than any money but i do think the money is also really important to people but even further than that 
the freedom thing, and I've thought about this a lot, the freedom, creative freedom and financial freedom, it's both of those things are a very weird moving target. I recently had this slapping me in the face because when I, when I left Sitka five years ago, I set some goals. And one of them was by age 50, I wanted to be financially free and creatively free. And I put some numbers behind the financial part of it, which I won't go into, but like the creative thing is just like basically the, the idea is we're only work on things that you want to work on and be able to say no to things without having like financial stress. Right. That's the idea. Yeah. And the number that I put on the financial stuff is pretty high in, in terms of like average income. Um, but it's not crazy high in terms of like American wealth. Um, right. I don't need, need that. But my point is, is like the other day I was sitting there, I was actually doing a podcast and I'm like, I've already kind of accomplished both goals, but I'm not even remotely close to that number. But I feel like me and some other people I run with, we already kind of are mostly work on things we only want to. I live a pretty good life. Like if you look at the average of the way people live around the world, I mean, my God, even the average American is wealthy. But even in terms of Americans, most of the people that I interact with, we're all, we're all lucky that we have our health. We li live in a house. We have a car. We have enough money to buy food. We have clean water. Yeah. And as you get older, you, you start to realize that's kind of wealthy. That doesn't mean that you can't try to make more money to do other things. But like, I yeah. guess it's what they've always said that always seemed cliche to me was, after a certain point of money wise of meeting your basic needs, I think the number actually was like 85 grand or maybe it's probably a hundred, 125 now, depending on where you live at money after that is like nice to have, but you've already met your basic needs. So it won't actually make you happier necessarily. You can do it to things that may, um, enhance your life. Or actually, you can also do it to th things that will like totally ruin your life. But my point being is the moving target of the freedoms is difficult to measure. Um, but I do think that that's really a worthy cause to shoot for. Freedom is like the most valuable thing. That's what the hell our freaking founders fought for, right? Of the country. The ultimate founders fought for us to be able to shape our own lives like it's the greatest gift and most there's a lot of countries where you can't do that right yeah no i'm with you i'm with you on all that i think that's those are wise words um there's a couple different things that really stand out to me one is our generation is really at this intersection of paradigms the paradigm that we were born into effectively could be described as do this, this, and this, and at some point you will be free. And the new paradigm, which was largely kind of, you could say kind of shoved down our throats in a weird way was like, you can do anything that you want and you can be free now. And I think that as a society, we're trying to kind of figure out how we individually coexist between those two paradigms. And it reminds me of a conversation that I had um, a couple of days ago with two ladies who are attorneys who reached out to me because they had an idea for a company and they wanted to talk about it. And so I got on the phone with them and they were telling me about their idea. And uh, I kind of always hate when this happens, but immediately I knew that I needed to tell them stuff that they didn't want to hear. <laughs> Like uh, your idea is trash. Well, the idea wasn't the idea wasn't bad by itself, but the disconnect was that it had really nowhere near the type of personal connection that is required to survive the thousand ego deaths that one has to go through to bring a company to life. And so, what I what we ended up talking about was exactly what we're talking about. And I said, "Look, I know that you don't want to be an attorney forever." I get that, but let's not let that desperation determine how we approach the next step. Instead, 
which leads you essentially to what idea can we do, right? Like a very kind of hollow version of entrepreneurship. Like what idea can we do? So what I encouraged of them was I want each of you to by yourself identify the things in this life, in this universe that you care about the most. And I want you to really search for injustices or gaps or problems or openings within the things that you really care about. And then I want you to come back together and I want you to talk about those things. And I guarantee you that any idea that comes from that conversation is going to be a hundred percent more viable in the long run than just coming up with an idea. And I think it's almost like a good symbol for, for this intersection of the two paradigms that our generation is sitting squarely between. It's like, and what you were talking about with this kind of notion that as soon as you slap the title of founder on yourself, that you're going to be in a Lambo cruising down, you know, Madison Avenue. It's like, you know, we, we, we fought so hard against the past paradigm of this whole nine to five thing, but don't go all the way to the other extreme either. Like the other extreme is, you know, let's come up with an idea and then we'll be rich. That's the other extreme from the, I have to go get a, this degree to have this job to eventually when I'm 65, be able to be free. Like let's, let's find that middle ground. And I, I really truly believe that that middle ground is really about purpose. And it's about understanding or the pursuit of understanding, like, what do you really care about? And it just so happens that if you focus on bringing an idea to life that actually matters to you, that there's a real world aspect of that, which is you're likely to be more successful in a space that you have a thousand percent chance of failure. You're more likely to be successful in that space. So what do you mean by that? What I mean is, is that there's a reason why really bright luminaries of our past and present have talked about the power of passion as it relates to bringing ideas to life. The reason why they talk about it and they, they headline it as being a critical aspect of optimizing your chances of success is because without that passion, when the going gets tough and your back is against a thousand spikes on the wall that are penetrating your skin, if that passion isn't there, then you will lay down and die. The passion has to be there. Well, where does the passion come from? The passion comes from a connection to purpose. So it's not, it's not some platitude. It's absolutely real and absolutely critical. If you're trying to be intelligent about the space or the life that you're trying to create for you and your family, it's not about, it's not about like, you know, like, Oh, you know, what does passion matter? If I have an idea that makes dollars and cents, that's strategically viable in a market that has good timing, then, then it can work. Right. And it's like, yeah, sure. It can work. But I promise you that if you put that up against somebody who has the same strategy, has the same idea, has the same intellect and creativity, but they have the passion and the unequivocal belief in what they're doing, that person will beat you almost every single time. And guess what? In the world of high performers, if we look at the highest stratas of any world, I promise you what you will find is people who are you know, a combination of the most creative, the most intelligent, the most insightful, the most experienced. But at the top of all of those stratas, you will find people who would literally die for what they're doing. They would die for it. And so yeah. they don't turn from that spikes against the wall. They're like, fuck it. Keep going, baby. Let's go. Yeah. Um, totally. It's... Because, and I think part of the reason for that is it gets so hard. That's it. In the, in the process, the, that's the only thing that carries you through. Because that's it. I, I've seen people try to start stuff before. I've even tried to do stuff before where it's like, you probably, you might have a good idea, but you only want to do it because it's either easy money or it's like some shallow reason, right? Like, and, and that, when and you get, when you get into when you get into the battle that doesn't carry you through the, 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 unbel the, um, when you're like totally deprived of all energy and ego and you're like, just effed. The only thing that picks you up back on your feet is like a true passion for something or love 
Like it's like <laughs> when your back's against the wall, right? But if you're like, ah, I didn't really love it anyway, you're going to, I mean, you might succeed, but boy, that's By tough. By the way, will... Dave, it doesn't just relate to the stuff we're talking about. It relates to everything. And I would say, especially relationships. This is maybe a good way for people to think about this. Um, you know, how many times have you heard one of one of your friends, Dave, over the last, you know, two decades, talk about what they're looking for in a partner, right? <laughs> they have these ideas. And this is this is completely corollary to what we're talking about. They have these ideas like, oh, it needs to be this kind of a person with this kind of a background, with this color of hair and this color of eyes and this kind of body and all these things. And I think it's a reasonable place to start when you, you know, maybe don't have the wisdom of having a lot of relationships that ultimately didn't work out because you didn't have a substance under all that stuff. But then what you come to realize is, you know, what you should really be tuning into is the admiration factor that you have for somebody, because when they piss you off, which they will, when they disrespect you, meaning like intentionally or unintentionally. The thing that saves you from giving up, the thing that saves you from saying, well, this girl is, is a this or this guy is a this, is the admiration that you have for that human being. And that admiration is equivalent to what we're talking about with passion, which is really a representation of, of a connection to purpose. Oh, yeah. That admiration that you have for your wife is what keeps the wheels on the bus when you're super pissed off because you're like, you know what? God dang it. I disagree with everything that she's saying, but she is an amazing woman and I don't want to mess this up. Yeah, it's it. Yes. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. I mean, even I can relate it to hunting too. Like, cause I see guys over the course of my life who think they want to try it. Right. It's, mm -hmm. and it's one of those things that if you just think you want to try it, bow hunting is probably not the greatest thing to just dabble into. It's a great like, analogy, dude. It's a great like, analogy. You, you, you're probably going to have a real rough time. And the reason is <laughs> because of the rate of failure, constant <laughs> failure <laughs> is, is mind blowing. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's actually mind blowing. Cause I, I talk about it all the time. Yeah. If, if you're a numbers person and you want your mind blown, like start working into the numbers of like the failure rate on bow hunting. Well, and Dave, and you that, talk about it all the time because if you didn't talk about it, you'd have nothing to talk about. <laughs> well, it's it's partially because I'm like, it's therapy for myself Yeah. because I struggle with it too. But the thing that gets me, the thing that pushes me through it is this l deep, 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 deep love for it. Mm -hmm. Because if I just kind of wanted to try it, it would be way too frustrating Slash, that, if you were just if you were trying it because you wanted to kill a trophy, which is equivalent to getting rich by having an idea yeah, and being an entrepreneur. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna try elk hunting. I, I'm gonna I want to kill a 400 inch bull. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> and, and I don't know what the odds are. Yeah, you might. I don't know what the odds are. It could happen, maybe. Yeah, totally. But for 99.99 times a million people percent of people, it's not the case. You're gonna struggle your ass off. For I think it's probably just like anything else, jujitsu or anything, five to ten years of struggling yeah. your ass off before you even yeah. get anything. Um, yes, and that maybe that's just kind of the equation for it's the whole ten thousand hours from uh, what's his face, the guy that wrote that book, ten thousand hours. I only know it from Macklemore. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, he was talking about it. There was a book. The, <laughs> he, the guy has a fro. He's really smart. Um, yeah, he talks about how any it takes ten thousand hours of doing anything to get good at it. Is the is the idea? Um, yeah. And I don't I don't think the with entrepreneurship, there are people that come, actually with anything, there are people that come out of the womb that are just wired differently. They're just brilliant. Steve Jobs. You know, Elon. Yeah, but Musk. he literally died for what he did, and that's my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it didn't take anything. Um, it didn't take anything. Uh, I'm not taking. He definitely. All of them struggle still, but they do have a step ahead just by how smart they are and how how like just their level of natural drive to get to do the thing. Yep. Whereas most people are going to have to. This is why lately I've really been harping on the idea of. I believe if you're an average, academically average person like me, 
you should work for somebody else that really is really good at what they do in, an, in a field that you want to work in for five or 10 years before you start something on your own. Um, that's my kind of fresh opinion. Unless, unless you're just crazy smart somehow, but like, I'm glad I did what I did at Sitka. Someone asked me yesterday, are you glad you left Sitka? And I said, it was the best decision I made to leave and the best decision I made to, to, to start both, both are true. But I don't think I, I know that I can't, couldn't do what I'm doing now if I wouldn't have gone through 10 years of hard knocks school, but you're not playing with your own livelihood necessarily. Um, mm. And you're learning, you're learning from people that are, that's my, that's my current opinion. If you ask, if, if the average dude asks me, that's my opinion, learn, learn it from someone else when you're young and then do it on your own. If you're going to start, I mean, you know, this Blake, you guys, you guys started your company in your early twenties and probably a lot of the mistakes you guys made now looking back, like if you were to, if you just take the same set of circumstances, the same idea at the same time period, but with 10 years more of age and experience, you guys probably could have avoided a lot of the mistakes. Don't you agree? Yeah. I mean, I think it's so individual, like it's, and that's kind yeah. of, the, I feel like that's kind of the point you're making. It's like, if you don't, fully believe that you can put your soul all the way out into the world, knowing that you're going to get completely rejected and your ass kicked, but you're still going to persevere and make an impact anyways. Then I think the advice that you just offered is the right advice. However, if you do feel the way that I just described, then I think you should go for it. And yeah, no, I definitely don't want to. I, 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 I like people going for it. I, I like that for sure. I just, let's just assume like, I don't know, maybe you have the new idea in the legal world or whatever. I mean, I, I just don't think it's harmful to go work for a firm for four or five no, years no, no, and not, like it, learn, learn the ropes, get connections. Cause inevitably, if you have a really cool idea, you can pull people from the industry that you, that you worked in. That's the sure. other thing is the connection. Cause I talked to somebody, um, a, a fellow podcaster in the hunting industry. He came up to me at the hunt expo a couple weeks ago. And he said, dude, how did you get so many connections? And I said, I worked at the best brand in the industry for 10 years. And that's how I did it. He's like, Oh yeah, I just came into it fresh. So I'm, I struggled to like have, you know, make meet all these people. And I'm like, yeah, I'm very fortunate. So it was a little easier for me to start a podcast because I already knew all these people, right? Does that make sense? No, it makes 100% sense. I just think that it's not one size fits all. And yeah. to, to answer your previous question, um, there's, I mean, I'd be a complete idiot and asshole simultaneously if I said that having less naivete when I started my first company in my mid-20s, a company that we sought to literally impact the entire world and change the yeah. perception around a massive topic in society that of course there, there, there are mistakes that I made that we made that wouldn't have been made. However, right. Kind of like what you just said of joining Sitka and leaving Sitka, both of those choices um, were the best choices that you could have made. Yes. I completely stand behind the journey that we set off on and it, you know how you're talking about like you were able to start a podcast in the way that you did because of the experience that you had and the people that you knew. Yeah. I have my own version of that that came from starting yes. a tech company in my mid twenties. That's, that's very true. So it's just, it's, it's so individual. And again, for me, the deciding factor is, is, is kind of what you said. I would just, in my own words, I would say it differently. Again, it's like if you're 23, 24, 25, whatever, and you have a very clear idea that is very clearly connected to your purpose on this world as, as far as you see it, and you have a great degree of self-confidence and tact and probably a, an assortment of other special skills and abilities, then freaking go for it, man. Now, if you're 23, 24, 25, and you're like not sure, and you don't really feel like you understand where you're supposed to be, and you don't really know what your superpowers are, but you kind of like you see an industry or, or a line of work that feels appealing, maybe, then I think the advice that you're giving is the most sound advice. Like, 
go into the real world and get experience. And so you're that that awareness of maybe where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do is more illuminated. But if you feel that illumination coming from within, my advice is fucking go for it because you already have something that most people don't. And so therefore you are in a good position to try something risky and you're young. And so taking a large amount of risk young is always the best idea because you don't have kids. You don't have most likely, you know, or even if you do, it's like a young marriage, you know, it's like, um, or, or what have you. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, you know, you're, you're my brother and, uh, I think the dynamic that we have, you know, you and I have worked together and continue to work together on a large variety of things, including this podcast and, and many other things. One of the reasons why we can work so well together is because we have had very different experiences in our journey as business guys, creators, what, whatever. And so I think that's an ancillary benefit of each of our individual journeys is that you're going to go on a journey and then you're going to meet somebody who has a completely different journey and you're going to be able to complement one another and create beautiful things together because you're coming from two different spectrums in the world. And um, I think that's, that's, that's beautiful too. And that's an ancillary benefit of all of us choosing our own path. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, you're right. It's not one size fits all. I, I, I just think, especially if you're a young man, like, Maybe you're even just getting out of high school, not sure about college. I just think the benefits of interning and work, like pick the industry that you want to be in, or at least you're interested in, maybe you have ideas in, go pick like a cool company. And especially when you're young like that, pick a startup, screw the big oh, yeah. companies, Yeah, P pick a sure. startup and go learn. Cause the, the chances are that founder, there's something you can learn from them and then skip around a little bit. Shit. That doesn't matter. You're so young. <laughs> Keep, yeah, like don't sure. have much stuff just bum around travel with these companies learn 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 and then by the time you're like you know late 20s 30 you have way more experience than anybody that went to college in my opinion um mm. or you know you can go to college and do that thing too i'm not necessarily bashing it although i do think it's got a lot of problems now um but i i think I just look back on how much I learned and still continue to learn from some people in my life. I just had a call yesterday from somebody that I used to work with who is just legitimately fucking smarter than me. I mean, he is just really smart, like in ways that I'm not. Um, and I always enjoy talking to him because I, st I learned stuff from him. I even, I said something on Josh on the podcast on Josh's podcast the other day and he heard it and he goes, he, he has a better way of saying it already. I'm like, damn it. Damn you, dude. You're freaking. <laughs> I said something about there's people that build companies and there's people that are, like come in later and scale them. They basically turn knobs, right? They like turn the volume up here, turn the volume down here, but they wouldn't have built it. They're just, they're not that person. And he goes, what you're really talking about is value creation and value optimization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, damn you, dude. That's a really smart yeah. way of saying it. Yeah. But there's people that you meet along the way that are just, if you're not meeting people that like, you're like, wow, that guy's like really smart and I'm learning a lot from them. Then you're around a bunch of dumb people and you should probably change your crowd. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So we grew up in a, I wanted to talk about childhood a little bit and family dynamics and sort of how we went on different paths and, get into that a little bit. Cause I thought it was pretty fun when I had dad and mom on the podcast. Yeah, let's do um, it. So talk, I've talked about my version of our childhood. Talk about yours. Like how did you end up where you are today f when you started in a rural logging community in rural Oregon? Um, talk about that, that experience. Like, what was, what was it like? Well, I mean, it was really wonderful too. Um, I guess, sorry, I'm, I'm having a, a monologue in my own head. Um, <laughs> we grew up at the end of the era of small towns being disconnected 
from larger society. When we grew up, living in a small town meant that that small town was the entire world. I mean, so when I think back, and, and that was amplified further by the fact that we grew up on a bunch of acreage out in the middle of the forest, you know, 10, 12 miles outside of town. And town was 10,000 people spread out over a, you know, 10 mile radius. Um, it was the last of that era, you know, we were just there. And, and for us, like <laughs> there meant we were just running around the woods all day, like swinging on the rope, swinging the Creek and bass fishing in the pond. Um, so that by itself in retrospect was such a special quality of our childhood that subject to being taken back to the stone age, kids of the future won't have that experience because they have Instagram. They have all these other things, but more to the family side, you know, the way that I always describe it to people, the way that I kind of characterize it to, I think, tell the story that I think matters the most is that mom and dad played very distinctive roles. What dad taught me was that anything was possible. And what mom taught me was to be unapologetically who you are. And the combination of those two virtues or principles, if you will, I think is the anecdote to when people nowadays, you know, talk to me or talk to you or talk to Luke or mom and dad and say, wow, how in the hell did, you know, these three boys from Dallas, Oregon go out in the world and do so much crazy shit? Like, how is it? How is that? Like, I don't get it. Well, it's because our dad showed us that anything was possible and our mom gave us the love of who we are as individuals and as a family. Those two principles are magic by themselves. And when they're put together, it's what equals you and I and Luke. Hmm. Like that is the equation in my opinion. Um, and that was those principles were drastically amplified by our intrinsic connection to nature, whether it be mm. in the forest around our house or growing up, going to, a, you know, managing the hunting rights and the recreation rights of a 25,000 acre ranch in Eastern Oregon, which might as well have been the frontier to being at the coast a lot in the coastal rivers, central Oregon, the wonder of that abundant nature only amplified, I think, that that personal connection that each of us had to each other, ourselves, and the possibilities of the world. You know, I always say that nature, <clears throat> nature was like my first mentor of the possibilities and of imagination and creativity. Um, I tell people that the biggest blessing in my life, for sure, outside of my, my wife and partner is the childhood that we had, like is all of those things that I just described. Um, it was fucking magical to grow up like in that, in that bubble of that small town in that era in the late eighties and the nineties and having the community that we did and that exposure to the outdoors and to, to hunting and recreation and that, that nurturing of the possibilities and that love of, of being individual. And it just, I mean, I owe almost every ounce of confidence and self-belief and this internal sense of freedom that I feel to those things which were created and they would joke and i'm sure they did to you or they have to you that 
they don't know how that's the, how what I'm saying is the net result of what they did. Like if you were to ask them, like, how did you, how did you do that? <laughs> They'd be like, I don't know, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's by far and away, you know, the greatest blessing I think of, of, of my life. And I think that you and, and Luke would, would agree with that. So, um, and then that was, that was further amplified by seeing, you know, being the youngest of us three, you know, when I was 13, right. It would have been 13, you know, Luke moves to Hollywood and, you know, I go down a couple years later and like, I'm standing in a room with Luke and like some of the biggest celebrities in the world, you know, Jennifer Aniston and Natalie Portman and all these other people. And it was like, dad was right. Mom was right. And, you know, then you going into the hunting industry and going into Sitka, you know, as a, as a founding team member, I was like, dad was right. Mom was right. And so by the time that I flew the coop, I had that confidence and that belief that I was talking about earlier that I was like, I can do this, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's how, that's the story that, that's the story that I wish to tell about our childhood, because I think it gives credit where credit is due in the most like specific and important way that I can, that I can articulate. It's interesting. You bring that up the way you did, because I agree with everything that you said. We were very fortunate. And unfortunately, a lot of the world doesn't experience great childhoods. Um, no. You know, my wife's a teacher and uh, there's a lot of kids that are struggling. And I think there's a lot of specifically because I grew up around them, rural males that struggle a lot because oftentimes in rural communities, it's not what you described. It's like you're going to get up, get, get to work. And you're going to get a job and move out as soon as possible. And you're going to get a truck and you're going to get a house and you're going to have some kids. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it. Actually, some of the most happy people I know did exactly what I just described. However, there's a lot of men, that men in general are struggling right now bad, but I can only speak to the culture I came from. There's a lot of these kids and men that I'm talking about that really, really struggle and I, I think about it a lot because I just keep hearing about these suicides and all kinds of things happening. And Rachel and I were talking about it last night and it's like, it seems like the most important thing that you can do out of all the bullshit we all, we all focus on is give, if you have kids, give your kids a healthy childhood because if you don't, that pain from whatever it is, maybe that's abuse or a divorce or whatever, things happen. Um, bad things happen all the time. Whatever it is, that pain transfers from generation to generation. And it never ends until someone stops it and does it right. And we were, we were so fortunate that our parents, yeah, we were flawed. We had problems. They made mistakes. All the things, human. But we were so lucky to have a pretty damn good childhood. And so when I look at my kids, even though I've came up short in a million different ways as a dad, I really want us to hold it together and give them the best childhood that we can do to give them a chance of not having some of these same struggles that are, that are going on in society right now. Cause I think a lot of them come from broken homes. I think that's, I don't have the data to back that up, but it seems like broken homes and a lot of it, a lot of times can be tracked back to the dad. <laughs> unfortunately, you know, dad's leaving dad's alcoholics, dad's abusive, whatever it might be. So the role as a, either a dad or just a male role model for young men and women, um, and girls is, has become like so prominently important in my mind to figure it out now, because I only get so many years with my kids yeah. and I don't think Mom and dad, I mean, I would like to think they intentionally gave us a great childhood, but I really think they just genuinely are great people. Like, 
and yeah, they, sure. they, they, mom's goal in our childhood, she always <clears throat> tells me this was to make it fun. Mm-hmm. And there's flaws to that thinking too, but that's pretty, that's a pretty great goal for a mom, right? Yeah. I mean, look, the reality is that, um, just because you can't have kids doesn't mean you should. There's, there's a lot of people that should have no business having children because they're not good people because they're not in conditions or, or circumstances, um, mentally, um, historically, whatever you want to say <clears throat> to actually ha- create the conditions for providing a childhood that is mostly love and affection and understanding and navigating complexity from a place of love. Um, so like, that's something I feel really strongly about because I see people sometimes and I'm just like, they're failed from the beginning because they weren't, they did, they, they shouldn't have had kids, you know, um, teach their own. I'm not like condemning those people. I'm just saying like, realistically, the odds of them creating a loving household with well-adjusted young humans is very low. And by the way, the odds of having well-adjusted young humans is already low for anyone because it's incredibly, it's, there's all, you know, David, you know, I'm not a parent, but I'm 39 years old and I have, I'm very observant and I have, most of my friends have children. I have nieces and nephews. I've observed, I've paid attention. I'd be interested to hear if you agree with this. Just like in any other aspect of life, people want to think that they have control. Um, I think the area that, that calls for that the least is with kids, because what you have with kids is influence that is fleeting every day that they get older. And so if you don't create a relationship with them at a young age and positive influence with them at a young age, and you just like are waiting for them to be teenagers, for them to be able to uh, actually cognitively understand the wisdom that you're giving them, (laughs) you're fucked. You're totally screwed. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to like stand on a soapbox about parenting. I'm just suggesting that my perspective on how mom and dad raised us and how blessed we are has only been amplified by years of observation of seeing how most people grow up. Yeah. I I think, I think, I think generally speaking, humans are fucked up. Therefore, There's lots of fucked up parents too. I mean, I just think it's like this. And because of that, they create an environment where the kid develop, a kid can develop issues even in good conditions. Of course. I mean, I mean, all kids have issues. Spoiler alert. Like parenting has all kinds of problems and it's not perfect no matter how many books you read. But there is a lot of screwed up people out there and if you're they're saying just passing it down, they're just passing it down. Like you said, it just keeps going. I, I, I think it's like these demons that get passed down. I'm just using demons as just the, something as to describe symbol, it, right? Yeah. yeah. They, they get passed down until someone kills them. Until someone says that's enough. Now that like a good analogy, I think is like alcoholism because alcoholism tends to pass down from generation to generation to generation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, until once somebody goes, you know what? God damn it. I'm not drinking like mom did. I'm not drinking like grandpa did. I'm not drinking like great grandpa did. This is over. Break the cycle. Break the yeah, cycle. This is over. I yeah. want to drink. I love drinking, but I'm not going to yeah. do it. That's just one example or drugs or physical abuse, or I'm no expert on any of those areas, but as an observing person, <clears throat> it seems, it seems like, or like even we were, t- a, a friend of mine had a friend, unfortunately take his own life here the other day. I didn't know this person. I, I knew of them in high school, but I didn't personally know them. And I was saying, man, that's so, that's so sad and unfortunate um, with stuff like that because of the decision that he made. Now, I don't know if he had kids or whatever. Let's just assume he has kids and a wife or whatever. Those kids are going to carry that. The wife's going to carry that. Their kids are going to carry it because it's going to somehow affect the way that they parent their next kid. You know what I mean? So it just keeps going and going and going and going. So pain transfers. So like if you're like a, 
if you consider yourself a strong individual, I think about this all the time. It's time to stop that shit. Like I've like, I, I want, I, I would much rather fight the demons for my kids than transfer them to my kids. Not to say that I won't transfer any because I'm not perfect at all. But like, you know, that scene, the Bruce Lee movie at the end, I don't remember which one it was where he has to fight his demon. Well, it's dragging the Bruce Lee story and it's exactly what you're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Cause he doesn't want that to go to his kid. Yeah. Right. It's a family. It's a family curse. Yes. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I need to watch that again. I truly believe that that, that is, that is the way that the world works. I truly yeah. believe it. Yeah, I don't think you're, I don't think you're immune from being fucked up if you don't have a bad family life. Like, I think there's a lot of people that had great family lives that are really screwed up. Yeah. But I think your odds are much higher if that demon keeps getting transferred down. A hundred percent, dude. Yeah. And the, the moral of this story is of course that what we're acknowledging is that mom and dad are by, by no stretch of the imagination. Perfect. No. Um, or even like, you know, like godlike, but they were able to somehow at least give us a memory of a childhood that made us feel strong and connected and independent and filled with wonder and possibility. And those were aspects that were passed down too, from well beyond anyone that we ever knew in our family and people in our community, you know, really, really wonderful friends, because another aspect, of, again, that may have, I, I alluded to it, but it's like one of the benefits of growing up in a small town, especially in the era that we did, was that there was community, like there was built in community. We had generational family friends that had kids that were kids with us that we grew up with and those relationships were predicated on relationships that our parents had and that their parents had and make no mistake that that community factor, that built in community factor also was a con a, 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 a huge contribution to us being fairly well adjusted humans. And that is another aspect that gets, you know, I think glossed over or almost lost in the shuffle because of course now the world is our community, but yet one of the things that is missing most from most people's lives in, especially in the, in the modernized world is built in community and everyone is out there searching for their community, but they don't have any community where they are. And mm. that's what I was talking about. Like, when I was talking about the the generation that we grew up in and the kind of the, the, that was the last part of a society that is no longer in existence in most places in the Western world, we had built in community. We were, we were having community outside of our community was not even a thought. It wasn't even an idea. Like when we went to, when we went to Salem, which was 12 miles away, we might as well have been in Singapore. When we met people from Salem and we met other kids from Salem, it was like we were meeting people from Sydney, Australia. Right. You know, and that that's a that's a useful that's a useful idea to kind of try to convey to people who are younger than us what it was like back then. It's like, you know, I wasn't I wasn't following someone on a phone that I didn't have that was making videos in London about their trip to London. And like thinking about what it might be like to be in London. I was like in the forest thinking about would we go to Portland in a couple of weeks to go to this comic show? And like, would I see like big buildings and like the world was smaller back then. And so one of the benefits of that was that you had built in community because you had to, that's how it functioned. And I think that's a huge part of what we're missing now. And of course, what we're all fucking desperately hungry for. And it's ironic that, of course, that I can connect with millions of people, but yet in my own town, I'm a stranger. Really interesting. Really, really interesting. And it's just unfolding. This is this is brand new. You know, we don't have it mm -hmm. sorted out. So no, not even remotely close. <laughs> I mean, 
just a couple hundred years ago, we, you know, if even if you go back 50 years, all right, like we're, we're not structured for the way any of this shit's going. Oh, no, it's, no, no. It's really, it's really bizarre and like weird. How I don't even know how even just the thought of my kids' lives, the life that's ahead of my kids is, and I know it's probably the same for every parent, but just that the rate things are moving, um, it's going to be a bizarre, <laughs> it's going to be a bizarre existence for them. I mean, there's a legitimate chance that by the kids my are my age, there'll be people living on Mars, mm -hmm. for example. Oh, that's actually or, not even, that's not even close to as strange as the actual reality will be. And then the whole AI virtual reality movement is what really gets weird. Sure. Sure. Uh, so I'm, I, I do think though, that there's, a, there's still a lot of kids that were, that are doing what we did when we were raised. I mean, I live in the country I, I see and I wish so bad, like you, you want to give your kids your exact childhood. The reality is, is that's just not going to happen. You have, no. it, it's just, you give them the childhood, you give them, you can't replicate these things. No, of course you not. give them the childhood, you give them. And so you do the best with the tools that you have at your disposal and the dynamics that you have and the demons that you fight. Like you just do your damned best. But mm -hmm. I, I hope that there's still kids that are raised like that. I hope that there's still those because I think the world needs them right now. I don't think we're meant to live in these big crazy cities and like a lot of the modern civilization, I think there's a lot of the bad things to it. It is what it is, but the nature thing. And as you know, with like all of, all of my projects, it all comes back to that. Like, yeah, yeah. The it's connection to grounded. The connection and the grounding to the outdoors is my North star in everything I do. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's that it's not definitely not the most profitable North star. No from a monetary perspective, I mean, the most profitable thing would be to get really good at finance and go to wall street and figure that out or something. But it is the most timeless North star for our species. Like well, no matter what connection. happens in the world, it'll always be valuable. It's our connection to our origin. Yeah. It's it what we are. Tether, it's the tether that we have to our ancient humanity period it's it's it you know how you just said like you can't replicate your childhood no you can't but you know what you can have the same as your childhood is you can put your kids in the outdoors because the outdoors were a huge part of your childhood you can't replicate the conditions of growing up in the late 80s <laughs> But you can put your kids out in the woods. You can take them out to, you know, the desert. You can take them up to the mountain. You can take them out to the ocean. That is a timeless connection to our humanity that when that is lost, fundamentally, we're no longer human. Like that's, and, and by the way, there, this is not like a, a hypothetical or an opinion that I'm stating, there is a movement of people who literally are going in the direction of being beyond human. And oh yeah, I, I can tell you because I've done pretty deep research into this, that a part of being transhuman, let's say, and this has nothing to do with, you know, the idea of, of transgender, this is a totally separate thing, is nature has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Like it's like the utilization and the integration of technology and technological capabilities and advancements to take us beyond where we are as humans. Well, into look a at the state. look at that. Look at that. Is it in Dubai? The line? You know what I'm talking uh, about? Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Saudi Arabia. The line. So yeah. For those that don't know what this is, I'm gonna totally botch it. Here, you know what? I'm gonna pull it up. But this, I think this is a good example of what you're talking about. Jamie, um, pull it up. I don't have a Jamie, so I'm going to pull it up myself. But the line here. So this is something that is actually being built in Saudi Arabia right now. And the goal of this, I'm going to bring it up. Accept all the cookies. So 
the goal of it is to create this it, the it's a it's basically this line right and it's 170 kilometers long and i can i think it's 200 meters wide and then it goes up 500 <gasps> feet so you can imagine it's like a big lego piece in the middle of the desert and the idea is is to create an entire society inside this line i'm gonna pull up a picture so there it is um integrated in every way you don't need a car you walk everywhere or use whatever like i guess there's like escalators and elevators and shit like that in there but the idea is this is the future of how we have to live on this planet otherwise we'll overutilize its resources i think that's the overarching idea um mm -hmm. yeah and some oh, people and, who live and look at this line, yeah look at what it says unparalleled access to nature that's weird <laughs> <laughs> nature that's been created right yeah clean yeah. air clean air for everyone more time to spend with loved ones a perfect climate all year round i do mm. like the perfect climate yeah that's a good uh one. <laughs> Let's see what they say about unparalleled access to nature. Our progressive design offers immediate and un uninterrupted access to nature with a two minute walk through its diverse open spaces suspended on multiple levels, equitable access to pristine views of the surrounding natural landscape, mountains and sky for all, avoiding urban sprawl thanks to reduced infrastructure footprint. So this is kind of an example of what you're talking about. Dude, this is weird. Yeah, this, I mean. This actually it's... gives me claustrophobia. Like shoot me in the face yeah so one of the interesting things about you know i, I think there there's there's kind of a this is indicative of a, of a whole narrative about where part of our society is going which is calling something that is entirely based on technology and radical advancements of infrastructure and drawing a straight line from that to live how humans are supposed to live and the, and you're kind of like well wait a second <laughs> this seems like a more cloistered version of a of a super city it seems like you know and, and look you know time will tell maybe it's the best thing that we ever created but it's it's certainly strange and i think most of us don't know how to feel about stuff like this um I keep I try to keep an open mind about most things. Um, but, but the, the, just to kind of circle back to where we started, it, what does this mean? Zero gravity living? Well, it's, and again, it's funny cause it's like built around humans, not technology, but in reality, it's the most advanced technology that is, is possible. So it's yeah, like world it's class, strange... world class quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by uh, the way, that's, I'm sure that's, if you're into that shit. Yeah. I mean, you know, if we're in the midst of a lot of people redefining what it means to be human, whether or not you're on board with it, doesn't really matter because there's a lot of people with virtually unlimited resources who are going in that direction. Yep. You are living in a very interesting time and you're going to see many things change. Um, radical open-mindedness is actually no longer a luxury. It's a necessity because of the rate that everything is changing. And, uh, you know, look with, with a lot of change comes a lot of opportunity. And so even taking it back to the beginning of our conversation, like there's never been a better time alive if you want to try to create your own way, because there's just an immense amount of opportunity that come from an immense amount of change. So you know, take it for what it's worth. But I think that from a personal opinion perspective, I think what you're going to see is over the next few decades, you're going to see as the line like projects and initiatives are pushed harder and harder, you're going to see a faction of society kind of split off the other direction. And you've already, you already have seen it happening. You know, the fact that you're seeing all these videos on YouTube about homesteading and growing your own stuff and all this, you know, people moving out of cities to start their own little micro farm. That is, make no mistake, the first indication of what you could call a fracture in society. And not like a, in a negative sense. It's just that there are certain people among us that say, 
I'm not interested in living in a 15 minute city. I want to be connected to real nature and I want to be connected to real community that's based on, you know, whatever kind of shared values or shared perspectives or, um, or, you know, uh, shared experiences, whatever. And then there are people who are like, take me to the promised land and put a neural link in my brain. And it's, Make no mistake, there is a very clear path to both to both directions that is taking place right now. <laughs> yeah. So no, and it, it's 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 weird, but you, I I see this in the hunting industry a lot, like because technology is a real talking point, right? Because a lot of why we like hunting isn't because i mean technology can help and enhance the experience for sure but it, it can also ruin a lot of things and so there's always this delicate balance of what is enough and but it's moving so fast in a lot of these areas like it you can't ha have all those individual discussions so like there is this level of open mindedness right. having the debates fighting the battles that you want to fight but also just knowing that everything we know when it comes to um, this stuff is changing so fast. Our brains can't even calculate it, it, You can't do the calculations in your brain. No. So it's like just a constant stream. I mean, just the amount of AI things that are coming out every day. Uh -huh. Like I'm using AI, I don't know, 20 times a day or even six months ago, I was using it zero times a day. Like that's pretty fast. That's pretty crazy. And it's like compared to what it'll be, a year, 10 years from now, a hundred years from now, this is like the stone ages. This is nothing. Yeah. They just actually successfully did, you know, they implant, they did, uh, they had their first patient with Neuralink and it was successful. Yeah. I did hear that. And, and well, the, first to, public, the first public edition of it. Right. And I think they, they came out, the, the guy can move the mouse with his thoughts already, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is like, not that big of a deal, but it's a huge deal. Well, it's a huge, it's a huge, huge step forward. That's I that's mean, weird. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's uh, some people say it's it's the most interesting time to be alive, and I think I tend to agree. I mean, I, I don't think you can absolutely say that like empirically because it's so dynamically different for every era of civilization <laughs> and society. But as far as if you look at it from a macro perspective in terms of the capabilities that are either being unveiled or being innovated, um, I think it's a fair argument to make. Um, I feel this goes back to the childhood thing. I personally feel very fortunate that I remember life very clearly and we are the last generation, again, subject to being thrown back to the Stone Age. We are the last generation that actually lived life without anything associated with the internet the, and the, the technology internet. and all thereafter. That is that is that is crazy. That is crazy. We were. I was just thinking about that. I remember when my first friends got dial up internet and I used to go over mm -hmm. their house. Cindy, Cindy's house. I used to go over to her yeah. house and use yeah. their dial up internet. And it was so slow and ridiculous. Yeah, and then we finally virtually nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And then we finally got a computer in our back room at our house. And I remember getting on AOL Messenger. And yeah. oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Now, now my kids can work an iPhone better than I can. Do you remember what your username was on AIM? I, are you purposely asking that because you know how stupid it is? Yeah. <laughs> what was it? My username was DB Net Snake. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. It's, cool. it's, it's, you would be arrested if that was your username these days. <laughs> yeah. You'd be freaking certified. Freaking, yeah. Like, yeah. That's not something that I would do. But yeah, but, it was DB Net Snake and okay. I was picking up on all the chicks. It was no big deal. Yeah. Yeah. All the chicks. There was like three of them <laughs> and two of them were dudes. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I feel really fortunate and when it comes to this idea of, of, Sometimes people, when they talk to me about this kind of stuff, a comment that they'll make is for somebody who seems to have a lot of like connection to the past and to ancient ideals and principles and ways of thinking, 
you seem to have a pretty open mind about like all of the stuff that's happening now that seems to be the exact opposite of the things that you seem connected to. Right. And I'm like, well, part of it comes from my actual experience, right? And and what that means is that for the first 15 years of my life, there was no technology. Right. Outside of, you know, the modern advents of technology, you know, of course, electricity and, you know, forced air heating, et cetera. Like the standard, right. the standardized tech that by the time that I came around was not novel. It wasn't like mm -hmm. it was it was conventional at that point. Right. Because I grew up outside of technology in the modern super contemporary sense and i lived life and had life before all of that and now have lived the majority of my life in the technological sphere not just as a citizen but as somebody who has developed advanced technology i have a perspective that is balanced my my i, I look at the 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 beauty of life that is unplugged and I look at the beauty of life that is plugged in. And mm -hmm. so that's, I think, why I can have this interesting juxtaposition between, you know, walking out every morning and grounding on the earth outside my house and then going back in my house and using the doing bleeding a podcast. edge. Yeah, doing a podcast <laughs> or, or using the bleeding edge of AI tools to create new things. This this yeah. this juxtaposition, this balance is my experience. And so it's it's my experience, just like all of us, our experience kind of determines the framework of our of our consciousness and how we think about the world. Yeah. So if I didn't grow up in the way that we did, I don't know that I would I, I'm sure that I would feel differently about all this stuff. Um, but I do think that there's Maybe. I think there's a balance that that we can strike. I think that technology yeah. can be <clears throat> can help humanity have holistically better lives. But if technology distracts us too far away from the genetic basis of our humanity, then I think largely there's going to be negative consequences. So yeah. some balance has to be struck, but I can tell you right now that balance is not going to be struck like in our lifetime. Yeah. Most likely it's not going to be. Right. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about elk hunting. Okay. Because, and specifically, I want to hear the story about your solo bull two years ago, mm -hmm. three, two years ago, three. So this was the, like the best text message I've got during hunting season for the last few years via Delorum, I'm pretty sure. Yep. Because you grew up hunting and you're and you've been around hunting and you're a hunter. Forever. But you really just started bow hunting for yourself, you know, in the last ten years, last uh -huh. five years, really. You just for whatever well, reason. Well, there's reasons, but yeah. Um, but, uh, we've had a lot of fun in the woods together and, uh, I got this tech. So you went, so we've hunted a lot together and, but you had verbally stated, I really want to get this done by myself for a multitude of reasons. Um, yeah. you'd missed well, a couple bowls. With, you'd missed a couple bowls with me. Yeah. And I would have loved to have seen you got those, but I actually think it ended up working out better. Because you went on this trip, I didn't have this tag, and take us on that mental fuckery of a journey <laughs> well, of yeah. killing an elk yeah. by yourself. Because we'll bring we'll we'll bring it we'll bring it full circle into the failure thing that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, for sure. So a couple things. Um, yeah, like you said, I mean, obviously, hunting and fishing has been an incredible pillar of my life as it has been for years. Um, props to dad, props to everyone who came before us that passed that down. Um, amazingly, amazingly influential <clears throat> on all of us for sure. I wasn't actively hunting for two reasons. One, I was like traveling the world trying to become a successful business person. Um, and I was just, 
hundred percent focused on that from age 25 all the way through age 35, essentially. Um, and the other reason too, was that I kind of always loved this idea of hunting for sustenance and for like being able to feed your family. And if I like shot an elk, um, before when I was like traveling all the time, then it largely would have gone wasted. So yeah. Uh, gosh, dang the parallel between like the complexity and the level of difficulty of like entrepreneurship and bow hunting is, is uh, like absolutely congruent in my mind. So you can imagine growing up in, in the shadow of the mighty hunter, David or Dave and the mighty hunter, David, our dad, um, was like trying to be an actor, uh, you know, being Brad Pitt's son. Uh, settle down, settle down a little bit. But, yeah. Okay. Well, se but seriously, I mean, it's like, you know, even though I've had decades of experience being out in the woods and I've had decades of experience being out in the woods with these master hunters, it's like, you know, you always kind of feel like you're a piece of shit and it's always piece of shit Friday. Um, <laughs> Every day is piece of shit Friday. Every day in the woods hunting with David and my dad is piece of shit Friday for sure. Cool. I'm um, glad you feel I mean, the same it. way I do. Yeah, it's amazing, but you know, it's also terrible. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, yeah, I felt, I felt like really drawn to fucking getting it done on my own because just like anyone else, like, you know, when you're in that kind of a shadow, you're like, you want to do it on your own, you know? it's not taking away from the influence or the dynamic of that, that kind of like tutelage or mentorship or whatever, but it's like, you want to get it done, you know? So I was sitting there with my, my girlfriend now wife. And I was like, babe, I got two choices this weekend. I can go over to the coast and hunt with my dad, and my brother, or I can go over to Eastern Oregon to this place that is very special to all of us. Cause it's near where we grew up on that ranch and I can try to get it done by myself. And I was really conflicted about it because obviously, like, I understand that I only get so much time in the woods with my dad and I only get so much time in the woods with my brother. But that drive to do it, to do it on my own had reached like a fever pitch. I think especially, Dave, if I remember correctly, because like a couple days before that might have been the infamous hold 45 low, 50 high <laughs> 44 low shoot don't shoot now uh can we tell that like, can we just give a micro clip of that story real quick like not the, the whole thing but just david and i were walking through the woods chasing this herd of elk and we got to a road crossing and realized that these elk were going to cross the road about 40 or 50 yards ahead of us it happened the herd starts to cross we see a spike it's coming up going to cross the road and david is literally a half inch from my ear like a fucking auctioneer <laughs> 45, 44, 44 high, 50, 50 low, 50 high, 50 high. Don't shoot, don't shoot. Hold it, hold it, hold it. I mean, it was like, I'm like, literally, if you would have seen, I was probably like this, and I won't be here at And it, I don't even remember where it went, somewhere into the forest. I think that was a couple what of What I said, before. just just for, just to, you know, clear my name, what I said was, what was it? It was uh, yeah, you know, yeah, forty four high, fifty low. No, 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 no. It it was thirty eight yards, and the verbal cues. And the when you're in stress like, like that, you're like, when you're in stress like that, you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Forty low, like what are you talking about? So now, now I know that, but it's it's kind of a funny story. All right, so you go you go to well, Eastern. You go, we, this we is like yeah, that, now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that uh. That probably was the week before you went over there. I think it on was because that was opening weekend. And then, so I'm sitting there with Danielle and I'm like, what do I do? And she's like, well, as fun as it was last weekend, that was really frustrating for you. So why don't you, <laughs> why don't you, you know, go, go try to get it done. So, and I, I had gone over a couple of times the previous year to this spot and had carved out a couple of areas that I just felt like really, I felt drawn to. I felt like, you know what? this is a good area. It kind of checks all the boxes of what you look for, for a good elk spot. Um, and so I decided to make the trip and I got over there. And, uh, the first day that I was there, I went up on this trail, um, up above this little drainage and found a lot of sign. 
and uh, and actually jumped a really nice, uh, actually two really nice six points, and was like immediately as as any of you know when you're kind of venturing out into this kind of a situation by yourself seeing those two bulls in this area that I drove seven hours to and hiked two hours into and had to bring all my shit and prepare for three days for was like the equivalent of winning a Grammy. Like I was like, okay, I'm not an idiot. I can do this. Even though I fucking jumped these bulls, I was 60 yards from them. There was never a chance, but it was like, I might as well have killed one of them in my own mind because I was like, okay, it's a confidence builder. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, yeah, you know, I think uh, I didn't really encounter anything the rest of the day, but I was um, I was camping with my cousin, Seth and uh, Uncle Stan. And I went back to camp and I said to Seth, I said, you know, there's elk up on this up on this this uh, this basin above this drainage. And I'd like to, like, make a move on these elk tomorrow morning. And I'd like for you to come with me. Um, I'd like for you to call for me if you would, you know. And so I talked him into it. He was a little reluctant not to go hunting with me, but the way that I wanted to do it was seemingly unconventional in his mind. So rather than going up, you know, because the thermals, um, the thermals in the morning, obviously are going to go up. Right. So I didn't want to go up from the bottom at thermals sunrise. In go, thermals in the morning go down, but they were going to switch and go yeah, up mid morning. That's, that's yeah. my point. Yeah. I knew that these elk were moving down through this area like mid morning or so. So I wanted to come from above. Well, he wasn't a huge fan of that idea because it's like we had to go off of essentially a cliff and slide down on our butts a couple hundred yards. But he, he went with me. So we go down, you know, about halfway down to this basin. He looks at me and whispers, I'm never fucking going hunting with you again. <laughs> and I was like, dude, just hold on. Like, let's see, let's see what happens. So we kind of mosey down. We make our way to the top of this basin up up above this drainage. And uh I said, let's do a little setup. And uh, he, you know, pops behind me about 60 yards, and I make my way up in this ponderosa flat to this little spot that I had good good shooting lanes on. And you know, he starts cow calling, and you know, nothing answered us, but I just had this feeling. I just I just had a feeling and the sun was cresting kind of over to my left over the top of the basin. And I started to kind of hear some very lightly. And I said, Oh, who knows what it is. It could be Seth, you know, back behind me and it's echoing or whatever. But then all of a sudden out of nowhere, no answer, no nothing. It was almost like our call was letting him know that it was okay to come over the top of this thing. He comes and he's walking towards me. And I just had this feeling of he's going to walk directly underneath me at about 25 yards. And I'm going to get a shot at this thing. And sure enough, 30 seconds later, he walks directly into my main shooting lane. And, you know, uh, Joel Turner would have been super proud of me. I just said to myself, I'm going to get this done. And I pulled back and I let the arrow loose and uh, all of you will relate to this too. I saw the arrow going like straight at the 10 spot. Like I was like, that was a perfect shot. Like boom, bull runs away. I holler over at Seth, tell him to come over at this point. I'm freaking, I'm razzle dazzled. I'm shaking. I'm all this stuff. And immediately I grab my, my, my Delorum and I text David, which is what he was talking about. Arrow loose. And, uh, you know, Seth says, well, let's, you know, let's chill for a minute. Any of you also know this, that, you know, you need to chill for a minute, but that's the last freaking thing that you want to do, obviously. So, okay. Did you hear, did you hear the bull? Like, did you, what'd you hear? You saw him run off and that was it. He just ran straight down the drainage. Like there was, it was like a bullet train Mm -hmm. and, you know, we're sitting there, we're sitting there and I'm antsy as hell. You know, it's been 10 minutes, but it might as well have been seven hours. And I just had this feeling like, you know, maybe we should start to think about getting and going after this thing. And then right as we stand up and we start to walk, I hear what I can only describe as a death bugle. It was, you've heard it, David, and others have heard it. It's the last sound that that elk ever made. Oh, you mean a a death moan? 
No, but it, he was bugling while he death moaned. It sounds it like that, bugle. but he, <laughs> probably we'll he probably was he probably wasn't bugling, but he was, yeah, it's like oh no, like it it's, was let's, let's let's for the history books, let's call it a death bugle. It was a bugle <laughs> and okay. a death okay. at the same time. And then okay. I heard I heard crash and I looked at Seth and Seth goes, That was running. And I said, No, that was a crash. And he said, no, that was running. I said, no, that was a crash. And I, I started, <laughs> I, I just started down and I find a blood trail, little drop, little drop, bigger did drop, you, bigger did drop. Did you wait? Not at that point. Did you wait past? No. No, it was like 10, 15 minutes maybe after the shot. But oh, okay. I was convinced of this death bugle and this crash as being the bull falling. So make the way down the blood trail. And I'm just like a freaking, um, I'm like a dog at this point. I'm just like, I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm on it. And make a way 150 yards down. And sure enough, there he is laying right there. And uh, I just broke down crying like a blibbering idiot and grabbed my cousin and my uncle and hugged them like there was no tomorrow. And uh, they were both very emotional too. It turned out, that was the first elk that my my cousin had ever been present for being shot with a bow. And my cousin is, I think, what is, he's close to 50, right? Probably pretty close, yeah. Something like that. That <laughs> fucked me up even more because he's like, that was so special. <laughs> you know, I'm just like. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I did it. And it, it felt incredible. Um, and I'll never forget. I'll never forget that, you know? And of course, after that, Seth was like, okay, well maybe I'll go hunting with you again. <laughs> Cause he was so pissed that I took him <laughs> down that cliff. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I eventually got a hold of Dave and of, of you and, and, and dad and, you know, that drive home, it was a whole saga getting, getting him off the side of that drainage story for another day but the drive out of that camp the next day back to the willamette valley was like the closest feeling that i've ever had to like looking through the window at the hospital seeing your newborn baby in the thing like it was just it's it was a great like all, feeling all the failures in my life outside of hunting inside of hunting yeah. business relationships mm -hmm. And I called my wife crying again. And I said, I can never describe to you how hard it was to get to the place where that just happened. Yeah. I can never describe to you how hard it is. Yeah. It can't be described. I, I really don't think it can be described. It can only be felt. And years even and years. Yeah. But even after you do it a lot of times, like, that that feeling that you're talking about never actually goes away. Yeah. And the feeling of just being a <laughs> you have more confidence, but it just never goes away is what I'm saying. And that is the cool th that is one of the cool many cool things about hunting is it's just hard enough that when you succeed, no matter how many times you do it, you're like, fuck, how the, the odds of that working out are like next to none. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and then driving home with that animal in the cooler, knowing you have all this meat and you succeeded and the dopamine hit is like, just, you just feel on top of the fucking world. You turn on some song that's like, Oh yeah. I remember I was listening to, uh, I was listening to, um, Oh God, cashmere Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I love that. No, no, no. And to me, and to me, elk is the epitome of that. I, it's hard to, I mean, I get same great feelings when I hunt anything, but taking an elk with a bow in my mind can't be matched. I mean, I, I, I feel the same way. I mean, you know, I haven't, I haven't shot, you know, 24 species with a bow, but like I, I have shot other big game animals with, with a bow and with a, with a, with a gun. And it's just, there's something super special about that pursuit of a rutting bull elk. Um, it's like, 
you're kind of almost hunting for the most ninja capable version of your warrior self like trying to trying to like slay the dragon that is the reflection of your warrior self it's like it's such mm -hmm. a it's such a mystical thing um and uh you know another feeling that i had which was kind of opposite of how i thought i was going to feel was rather than vindicated of that shadow that i was talking about earlier i actually was like in more reverence of the shadow in less judgment of the shadow than I was before. Cause it was kind of like, I was like bitter a little bit before that of like, you know, my dad and my brother don't respect me as an elk hunter, you know? And I was like, if I get it done, I'm going to be vindicated of that. But actually the feeling was, Oh, I haven't respected them enough as elk hunters. Mm. And it just kind of like, I feel like it just kind of like leveled the playing field. And in subsequent years, hunting with with you and dad, it just felt like it was like diffused a little bit, you know, um, and just made me incredibly grateful for all the the many, many, many mornings and evenings that I've spent with with you and dad and other people that have been huge figures in our life, you know, chasing elk. Um, it's the Olympics of 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 hunting in my mind, and I think we're so fortunate that we grew up in a place where we, you know, it's native to us, right? Like it's it's native. We need to, to get, us. we need to get you. I really want to get you on a good backpack hunt. Sure, a yeah, good I'm backpack hunt. That. You would love we it. Do it. We should do it. Um, brother, love you. I appreciate you. You always got so much wisdom. We need to do this again, and um. There's so many things that that you're working on that are have worked on, are working on, and just I'm proud of you. And I've been wanting to do this podcast for a while. Next, I'm going to have Luke on, which is my older brother, which most people don't know about my older brother. But my older brother <laughs> it has lived one of the craziest lives I could ever even dream up in a movie. Um and it's really worth talking about. Looking forward to that. But absolutely, man. In the meantime, do you have any parting words of wisdom? Um, no, I mean, just really proud of you too. And uh, I love being a part of what you create. And you know, you've been a continual inspiration and source of support for me. And uh, so blessed in that way too. Um, yeah. Other than that, just. Uh, if you if you believe in yourself, then frickin do it. And regardless of uh, regardless of the inevitability of the piece of shit Fridays as they come, just remember that you have two choices. You can laugh or you can cry. And my advice is that you do both. Hmm. That's really good. So and my advice that, is no matter how many, no, no matter how many times on piece of shit Friday, you get strangled from behind during the week. Headbutt the young <laughs> kid that just came to his first <laughs> okay, Headbutt him in the face. <laughs> uh, tap out and turn around and re-engage. Tap out, turn around, re-engage. I love it. Bro. All right. Thanks for Appreciate having me. Appreciate it. Hey, hey guys, everybody, uh, head over to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's the at the Altitude Show. All these podcasts are up there, plus clips from the podcast. You won't regret it. Um, what else do I need to promote? Before, like ruthlessly promote before the end of it. Yeah, Mountain Tough, Go Hunt, all the things. Have a great day, guys.